After everything she's been through, after all the setbacks, the doubt, the anxiety attacks, the public perception, and the negative media attention, SZA still struts onto stage in front of her tens of thousands of fans, performing with unwavering confidence despite the negative influences, whether internal or external. With every step towards the center stage, the crowd erupts louder in anticipation before SZA performs her hit song, Kill Bill. The sea of adoring fans, undeniably lost in the present moment, recite every lyric of SZA's songs, unaware that the very artist they're so engulfed in in this moment has mentally drifted away to the furthest place from this moment. Even when I'm singing my music, mm. it's almost like I'm cosplaying myself. Like I'm cosplaying an artist, like what that would be like. SZA never wants a fame. In fact, she despises it. Yet she treasures her impact and connection to the community that her platform provides. Like performing in an arena, what that actually means and how to like not let that energy command me and overtake me and shut me down, but then like really be present in the moment enough to talk to myself while I'm doing it, like to hear my inner voice. From her humble beginnings as a shelter kid in the suburbs of New Jersey, to her meteoric rise to international stardom, SZA's raw talent, perseverance, and authenticity molded her into a beacon of inspiration for a generation yearning for genuine connection and expression. But with her rise to the top came a sobering realization. The life SZA thought she wanted came at a permanent cost, forcing her to confront the challenging contrast between the glitz and glamour of fame and the realities of her own vulnerability and insecurities. I have a lot of anxiety about the world and like my thoughts and what people think about my thoughts and like. But you know, we all love you, right? Despite this, SZA's impact extended beyond just music. Her unapologetic embrace of vulnerability and imperfection resonated with audiences worldwide, cultivating a cult-like following. Industry obsessed with image and perfection, where manufactured personalities and superficiality are rewarded, SZA managed to remain an artist known for her unwavering authenticity and ability to challenge societal norms while still becoming one of the biggest names in modern R&B. Or has she? As SZA's stardom rises, so do the challenges she faces. What happens when her authenticity and honesty, the very qualities that endeared her to her fans, becomes questioned and challenged by those who once admired her? But I thought everybody knew that SZA was like this unprovoked liar. Now, Solano, why the F you lie? But no, 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 no. How it is. SZA's a liar. Then what do you mean? If you Google all the time SZA's lied, she's a liar. Oh, I see that. What happens when the pressures of fame threaten to overshadow her true self, forcing her to confront the harsh realities of stardom, even at her lowest? Wait, I'm waste time again. You're being dark. This shit. I'm having Wait, wait, why? <laughs> I'm so tired. I'm tired. What happens inside the complex mind of SZA? Before we continue exploring Scissor's journey, I want to give a quick shout out to today's sponsor, Surfshark. Surfshark is a VPN that encrypts your data, protecting your privacy while you're browsing the internet. In a world where everything we do online can be tracked and sold, it's a game changer. You've probably noticed how prices change depending on where you are. With Surfshark, you can avoid price discrimination by connecting to servers in different countries to find the best deals on flights, hotels, or even streaming services. When you're online, your data is always at risk, whether it's from trackers, hackers, or even advertising. Surfshark 
Encrypt protects your privacy by encrypting your data, making sure that your personal information stays just that personal. And here's the best part. Surfshark lets you use their VPN on unlimited devices with just one account. Whether it's your phone, laptop, tablet, or even your smart TV, you can cover everything at once. So there's no need to pick and choose what device to protect. And Surfshark doesn't just stop there. They also offer Surfshark Alert, which notifies you if your personal information like emails, passwords, or credit cards have been leaked online or the dark web. It's like having a watchdog for your digital security. If you're ready to take control of your online security, I got the hookup. Use my code spatial for up to 86% off and an extra four months free at surfshark.com slash spatial. Plus they offer a 30 day money back guarantee. So there's no risk in at least giving it a try. I also listed a direct link in the description below. Thank you Surfshark for sponsoring this video. Scissor's story begins in the quiet suburbs of New Jersey. Born Solana Imani Rowe in St. Louis, she and her family moved from the Midwest to the East Coast for her father's career. In St. Louis, originally. And then in Jersey, my daddy worked for CNN. Um, and he, when they merged like with Time Warner, he moved us all. To the I'm Bernard Shaw. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Solana grew up in a strict household where expectations were high and freedom was limited. You know, your father had control uh, right. of a lot of your life growing up. You, you had a pretty strict father, right? Yeah, I have. I have a... Still have. <laughs> her parents, successful in their careers, tended to push Solana and instilled a strong sense of responsibility in her. However, the pressure to meet high expectations likely caused her to pursue goals that weren't inherently fulfilling or aligned with her true passions, even if she didn't know it at the time. Correct me if I'm wrong. I read this. You were fifth in the nation once in like gymnastics or something yeah, like this? Yeah, for a long... Yeah, that's high school. Damn. So that's So like, like fifth in the nation? Like you were the fifth best in the nation? Out of high school, so that's not like... But still, out of all high school students. I definitely wanted to be good, uh -huh. but I also completely, the second I got any kind of like accomplishment, you I You checked just, out on it? Uh, completely. Despite achieving milestones that met external expectations, Solana often found herself indifferent to these accomplishments. This disconnect may have fueled a drive within her to seek validation or prove a point to herself, to her parents, or to the world. I was that kid, like I get to a goal, I quit. I get to a goal, I quit. <laughs> yeah, like, because yeah, yeah. It, that, that's all, it was just like, oh, I just wanted to like make sure that I wasn't dumb. Like I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't <laughs> yeah, like yeah, incapable. Yeah. Because I wanted to just make sure I could get A's like just cause like, you know. Yeah. Now we all know. <laughs> Regardless, Solana would carry on with gymnastics, dance, and cheerleading with the intention of taking it as far as it can go. Wait, that's good! Wait, that's good! Cheerleading was very interesting. I, I, I think I cheered for like one semester with a hijab and like a turtleneck with my dad. Whoa. And then I stopped doing that. That was so random. My dad was just like, yeah, so... You're gonna wear leggings and... House leggings, tell that in your dad. Solana's parents were highly successful individuals in their careers and were able to provide her and her siblings with a fairly privileged childhood. And I realize now they were only strict because they're reasonable. Like, they're black, they come from the South and the Midwest, and they don't come from anything. They're moving into the suburbs, they're very conservative. But they were divided on their views of religion. Your dad <clears throat> is, is uh, he's Muslim, yeah. yes? Your mom too? No, she's Christian. So your mom, that's very interesting. Very, how was that in the house? So did you do, um, you did. So respectful, but. So you went to church. You went every to. Every other Sunday. And then also to the mosque. Yeah, I went to Juman. While Solana grew up with a well-rounded understanding of religious differences in her household, unfortunately, the outside world didn't. After the 9-11 attacks, her dad's mosque will be attacked with someone throwing a brick through the window. And Solana herself endured bullying at school for wearing a hijab due to Islamophobia. After 9-11 and like yeah. being in school and kids being like, you know, like, scared and ignorant, trying to snatch my hijab off and talking crazy and families are sad and people are getting disrespected, then you know, you start to watch the stigma with Islam, like the negative stigma mm -hmm. just grow and morph and just like snowball. And it's just like, what? Like, mm -hmm. how did all of you even find time to bandwagon this? Like, right. what's going on? While she eventually decided to wear her hijab again, Solana was often judged for not being devout enough or faced projections from non-Muslims telling her she was being oppressed due to her head covering or bullied for simply being different. And I would try to like change things about myself to make people like me. Mm -hmm. And while the brief changes would bring a brief change in behavior toward like the way people treated me, it didn't change, like it didn't increase my friends, it didn't increase my confidence, right. it didn't mean that I 
can now beat up the girl from around the corner. Like, right. Solana's upbringing as a black Muslim girl in a predominantly white suburban community contributed to a sense of not having control over her environment. This theme would later be explored in her music with songs like Omega. Just rethinking my childhood. Like Omega grapples with my mom being Christian and my dad's Muslim. So it's like, let the church say amen when they saw my sins at the pulpit. That's the beginning. Even though she would go on to create innovative music throughout her career, Solana's musical foundation was initially limited. Her father only allowed her to listen to jazz and soul artists like John Coltrane, Miles Davis, and Ella Fitzgerald. I had the best of Ella Fitzgerald CD when I was like eight or nine. My dad was a stickler for letting things get into your mental space, like what you would watch and hear. So the only thing I could listen to was whatever he listened to. So we listened to a lot of jazz. Despite these limitations, Solana discovered Bjork through dance, sparking her interest in a wider range of music. So I had this one iPod with all the Bjork, and we used to dance to Bjork and um and dance because I did American Ballet Theater and yeah. the fucking yeah, all that so. nonsense. That emo emotion heap, like all that type of shit is what yeah, we're dancing yeah. to. One year at dance camp, she found a broken iPod and discovered artists like Wu Tang, Common, and Most Def. I went to like a pre-college program, yeah. and it was like um, another old one, like the Nano, and I had like old Common and yeah. like Most Def, all kind of crazy shit on it. Despite broadening her musical taste, Solana still felt the pressures of her strict up upbringing and limitations growing up. The high expectations from her parents and rigorous household rules created an environment where she felt that she had no control. I think I was just like this other thing in myself, like in my brain. I had to try to upkeep this other thing because this other thing like kind of had to be here, but I didn't even think this other thing was that important. I was just like, going through the motions, because it was like, whatever, this is what's playing out right now. This internal struggle combined with an external judgment and societal pressures led Solana to rebel in a desperate attempt to assert her own identity and control over her life. Strict level of parenting caused you to learn and even push against the strictness in some ways, right? Yes. Because I rebelled really hard and I learned everything the hard way. During this rebellious phase, Solana stopped doing gymnastics and quickly put on weight. <laughs> you were 200 pounds? Yeah. How old were you when you were 200 pounds? Uh, this is like five, six years ago, not even that long ago. Really though? Yeah, and I really didn't know how much I weighed until I got sick and went to the hospital for a completely unrelated reason, mm. and they weighed me, and my mother thought they were lying. You must have like a heavy ass foot or something. Solana didn't know it at the time, but this rebellious push to regain a sense of control will become a pivotal part of her journey, leading her to the music that would eventually make her SZA. I think my favorite thing about SZA is how much of a backstory she has. And I always say SZA is like the person with nine lives. Like she's lived a lot of lives. Honestly, before she really blew up, she did speak a lot about like her strict upbringing and trying to find herself. And then when I discovered her, I really do feel like that's kind of the stage I was in in life. So I like that. I like that um, she was able to break out of that and um, find herself artistically. So I think really though, she needed that. You know, like that was kind of her phoenix is going from a super oppressive household and not knowing who she was to stumbling and then becoming like the star that she is today. While Solana enjoyed listening to music, she never had a desire to make music. It wasn't until her brother, who was a rapper, asked Solana to sing on a track that she discovered that she actually had a knack for it. So he was like, okay, sing on this hook. And I'm like, well, sing what? And then he's like, well, just sing, like whatever you feel. And that was weird. So hearing my voice back was like, I don't like this, but I feel like I don't hate it. So I know enough about it that I can like change the nuances that I don't like. So I'm like, okay, I'm nasal. I'm this, this, and that, I have da, 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 da. So I go back in and try it like a bunch of different ways and like be like, oh. Discovering this newfound talent was like love at first sight. A spark went off and the two began refining her voice, making songs on GarageBand and hooks for her brother's project. So then I'm like making little GarageBand songs and then he's, now he's forcing me because he found out that I can low key sing <laughs> for real. So he's like, come sing over MF doing beats in front of the TV, like. But I didn't know anything about music, so singing Biggie lyrics over MF Doom beats was just like, this is a weird beat, but I'm into it. Like, whatever. If you want me to do it, I'll try. Anyway, so he would Joe Jackson me for like <laughs> weeks. While exciting and new, Solana's newfound talent of singing would just remain a hobby. Planning for her first year of college caused singing to drift into the background of her life. Did your family, were they supportive of your music? Career? It definitely was a hobby mm. at first. They were like as polite as black parents I want more for their kids could be about mm -hmm. a, a potential it. hobby. So it's just like, that's real nice. But. Sure you do that in your own time. <laughs> yeah. 
let me know how them grades is going. <laughs> the plan was to go to Delaware State University and study marine biology, and it was a good plan. The only problem was it wasn't Solana's plan. Over the next couple of months, Solana bounced between schools and majors, unable to find her footing. And I was good at school, but I was bored. Right. When I, when I'm really bored, I think needed I, more of a challenge. And, I you need know. satisfaction to like complete anything in life. Eventually, growing unmotivated after realizing she pursued her studies for the wrong reasons, Solana decided to drop out. You went to college to be a, a marine biologist, right? I went to college to be five things. Oh. So first, it was mass comm because I wanted to do broadcast journalism. What's up? What oh wait, doing broadcast right now? Shows, yeah. <laughs> science and biology, not political science or management. And then I failed at all of it. This marked a low point for Solana. Getting a college education was drilled in her head from young. Even though she realized her passions were not aligned with that direction, Solana still had to pick up the pieces of her life and make something out of it. I started staying on people's couches and vibing aimlessly. This sent me in a crazy depression, but also lit a fire under my ass. Solana didn't know what she wanted to do with her life. She was stuck. So in an attempt to gain control, she moved in with her boyfriend and began working at a strip club as a bartender quickly falling in love with the culture of rebellion and money. Before all of that, I was bartending at the strip club. I was also like 17, breaking the law and shit. Like, you're supposed to be 19 Damn. to bartend in New Jersey. Actually, right. Yeah, but it was very, 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 very fun. But it wouldn't take long for her to realize that again, she chose the wrong path. Right. But the one time I knew it was not for me is when I got hit in the eye with $100. Wait, what? He rolled up $100. Was this in New York or in New Jersey? In New this Jersey. Jersey. Okay. And he the dirty, dirty? threw the hunted and it hit me in my eye. Just out your face while you're serving them a drink? Yes, while I'm serving drinks in the That's mix crazy. of the club and everything's That's going crazy. Up. I was like, what the fuck? And I started going ham and he was like, you should be grateful. And yeah. that's when I knew, like, I'm probably in the wrong place. When looking around, Solana saw her family, who was accomplished and full of high achievers. They're very accomplished people. They're very accomplished. And my sister has a master's. She just got her, what, second master's? It's a very tough act to follow. She saw her peers from high school who seemingly had their lives figured out. And she saw her boyfriend who had his life together as well. Mm -hmm. And he was, like, eight years older than me. But he was like, you know, when you don't pay for shit, you can't be out here acting like you pay for shit. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, but he didn't say it to me. He said that about someone else, like another one of his friends. And I'm like, damn. I wonder if you feel that way about me. It was like everyone around her knew what they were doing and where they were going with their lives. And as time went on, Solana started to struggle with a sense of failure and inadequacy in her life. But I got fired from every job, like, every, and then, except I quit Sephora. That was like the one job I ever quit. And I was like disappointed in myself. I was like, damn, you didn't even get fired this time and you still quit? But, but. It's, it's the story it's of a lot of artists, though. At her core, Solana has always been a strong-willed person. Despite the pressure and feelings of inadequacy, she knew that she had to find her own path. This determination drove her to take control of her destiny, even if she only had one more option. I don't have any other options. Like, I don't have any other choices. Like, you before have, this... You have so many skills, though. I, but I don't oh. have any desire for them. Gotcha. Like... Before music, I was just bartending because my only other motivator was feeding myself. But I didn't, I didn't have anything that I felt passionate about. Something about music and being able to express myself in a way that didn't involve anybody else. It, it, that was maybe this is just who I'm supposed to evolve into. Like maybe after this, I'll get into visual art or, or film. Or, but right now, this is where I need to be in terms of like growing. It was during this period of uncertainty and self doubt that Solana returned to her love of music. But this time, with a renewed sense of purpose and determination in what she was doing. And the first step was finding an artist name that fit her. How did you come with SZA? Well, my friends call me Sos for short. Solana just cut to Sos. And initially, it was like Sosa, like a thing. And then Chief Keef came out and it was like, this can't be a thing. This is like embarrassing. With her childhood nickname being taken from Chief Keef, Solana decided to turn to her faith for inspiration. Sovereign Zigzag Allah, the supreme alphabet, connects to a lot of areas in my life. I love the Reza, he's brilliant. Love the woo. I love the ambiguity because it's like, is it a male name? Is it a female name? Mm. It's just the letters represent what they represent. Up to this point in her life, Solana consistently felt that she had no control. She felt like a passenger in her own journey. Her family's expectations, the constraints of her strict household, and the societal pressures she faced seemed insurmountable for Solana to handle. But SZA? SZA could handle it. SZA could write her own story. SZA would be undeniable. SZA would have control.
Driven by a desire to prove that she could be somebody, SZA turned to music. It was here where she found solace in writing lyrics and creating soundscapes, hoping that through her music she could regain control of her life. It wouldn't be long after this decision that SZA would have the opportunity to introduce herself in her music to Top Dog Entertainment or TDE, the music label home to Kendrick Lamar, Absol, Schoolboy Q, and J Rock, a group of rappers also known as Black Hippie, J Rock, Black Hippie, Schoolboy Q, Black Hippie, Kendrick Lamar, Black Hippie. Black Hippie. SZA's boyfriend at the time was a creative director for the streetwear brand Ten Deep, where she helped out delivering clothes and running errands for the company. In 2011, Ten Deep sponsored a show that TDE would be at as Kendrick Lamar was headlining that night. Welcome to my diary. Stress ain't got me gray hair. Something to inspire me rather than society. So SZA and her friend found themselves tasked with delivering Ten Deep's clothes to TDE's team. When I met her, she was actually helping out with merch at a show we did with Kendrick. Ironically, her friend was listening to something she just recorded in the earphones and I asked her what it was she's like it's her she sang and like her voice was so distinctive like I haven't heard anything like it and then when I started listening to the words, she attacked it as a lyricist. I'm like, oh, okay, I know what that is. I know how to work with that. Impressed with what he heard, Punch gave SZA his contact information and suggested she stay in touch while making more music. This put a fire on SZA. At this point, she's only shared her music with a handful of people. And Punch, being the president of a record label interested in her music, was a confirmation that she was on the right path. It was such an easy call. I was thinking of ways to further the label. She matched the energy creatively. But only minutes after leaving the hotel, this positive encounter would go left when she received a phone call from Punch. And Ten Deep was sponsoring it at the time, and I brought some clothes, like a whole merch bag that was on a Sunday, the day after his show. Right. And it was like, Top wants three X's, but Ten Deep doesn't make it three X. Right. But I brought everything, like for the boys, but I just didn't have anything for Top. So because I didn't have anything for Top, he called me after I left and dropped off all the merchandise and was like, Come get this shit. We don't want this. And I thought I'd never hear from him again, ever. Turns out that was like our first introduction. Wow. And the worst had already happened. I'd already been cursed out. So, so it's like good. from there, it's just straight up. Using the resources she had, SZA did what she could to make more music. I was bartending and like trying to pay for studio time, but it wasn't really a studio, it was my homeboy's closet. <laughs> After creating a song she liked, SZA released her first EP, See SZA Run, on October 29th, 2012. Listening to the EP, you can clearly hear SZA's influences of Bjork infused in the project with its ethereal soundscapes and unconventional song structures. But the EP stood out because of the writing. See SZA Run was raw and at times uncomfortably honest, and it's these qualities that SZA will build on throughout her discography. So my first project, See SZA Run, was like a collection of of songs that I made with Daniel. So I was talking about, I'd rather die than be your slave, slip my wrist wide and take the stage. I want to be my own person. I want, I'm dis I disappointed my parents. I failed wow. out of school. Mm -hmm. Like I wasted a gang of their money. Like my boyfriend thinks I'm a waste of his money and time. Damn. Like, like there was a whole bunch of things that I felt like I belonged to other people because I was feeling them, but it was really more so about the way I even felt about myself. Was Tinket Punch's suggestion, SZA sent her project to him. Punch then shared her music with all the artists at TDE, gave SZA some pointers, and encouraged her to keep going. All of them are very lyric-driven. That was what I feel like mm -hmm. was super appropriate, just about everything. Like, it just, it fit, because they kind of, like, were super into what I was saying when I was really talking about. I was very different, and I still think some of them not all the way through. I don't know what the f*** you're doing, but I like it. <laughs> Her EP was also met with positive reception from music critics. Complex wrote an article praising the project saying, This was made for multiple listens, as each song flows together perfectly and succinctly. The Guardian claims SZA to be the female counterpart of The Weeknd and Frank Ocean. This ended up being completely true as SZA and Frank Ocean both developed a knack for dropping the best album you've ever heard, then disappearing into the abyss for years. Regardless, the positive reception to her music motivated SZA to keep going. While C -SZA the run was rough around the edges and honestly sloppy in a sense, it was obvious to anyone who listened to her EP that SZA had a lot of potential as an artist. She just needed to keep working at her craft, and that's exactly what she did. While working on her next project, SZA used the money she made from bartending at strip clubs to pay for studio time. In between and I failed at my regular job or got fired, I would just go back to strip club. Honestly, that shit paid for my studio time whether it ain't paying. She was working, she was working at, working at, at like a strip club, like a local strip club type of thing, and she would come and like pay me like $200 in ones, and she, I'm I remember it was around Hurricane Sandy. I went over to her house and, you know, 
it uh, knocked the lights out and dark at the thing, right? Yeah. She was there, had made a fire, and was just counting ones and killing this fire. It was like, it was iconic. Wow. Like, I'm not gonna lie to you. While the money was good, eventually SZA realized the strip club lifestyle hindered her more than it helped her. And if she wanted to make it as an artist, some hard decisions needed to be made. I had a show at the same time I was supposed to be working at the strip club. Oh, okay, okay. So okay. I was like, I told my boss, I'm like, hey, like, I lied and told him I had to babysit. Right. Like, and I, like, my sister, I was like, listen, I can't, I can't really be here. My parents, like, ah, I got to babysit Hurricane Sandy. Was this also when All Gold Everything was out? Yeah. Like, it had just yes. came out? Yes. Oh, this so you knew big. it was that time. I had to go. Yeah, you had to. I had this to go. All, so he's like, he's like, I don't give a fuck about your family. So then I had to turn up and quit in front of everybody because it was- Wait, Trinidad like, James said that? No, my boss. The boss. At, at the club, so then I lost my, that was my last show club job. Wow. And then ever since then, I went to the CMJ show that got shut down before he even got on stage. Right, right. And so it was for no reason. But it was all for a reason, because. That's such a crazy story. <laughs> <laughs> Making the decision to quit working at strip clubs made Rum and SZA's life to grow into the artist she was supposed to be. This wouldn't be easy though. Keep in mind SZA grew up with a limited exposure to music. Until recently, she's never made any music on her own, let alone attempted to make a career out of it. Because it's something that I'm unfamiliar with, the people, the process, the risks, mm -hmm. the courage that it mm -hmm. requires. In order to really succeed, you have to live on the outside of like your own body, like the outside of your skin. And it's very difficult for me naturally because right. I don't I don't know like I would never volunteer to be right. that way right. in any other instance right. like but SZA was determined to take control of her life so she had to try she kept in touch with Punch from TDE collaborated with upcoming artists traveling between New Jersey and Los Angeles and began developing a sound that was authentic to her as I was in a different place just like literally my life was in a different place I was barely eating like all day like I didn't have any money to eat I quit my job and everyone was like what the fuck is wrong with you why would you do that six months after the release of CC a run, SZA found herself up at 6 a.m. fighting sleep and tweaking her next project, S, just hours before its release. I recorded Castles, Wings, Terra Dome, and Interlude the night before I dropped S. I went home from the studio at like 4 a.m. Then like me and Jolie like sat down and went through like... Exhausted from the day and mentally drained, it was this early morning that SZA gave name to her iconic sound. Crazy tired. I was just drifting off and she was like, wait, there's one more step. We have to like name it for what they're going to see. I was just all annoyed. I'm like, I don't know. What does it sound like to you? And she was like, well, it feels like trap. I'm like, but I love trap, but I don't want people to feel like I'm just trap. So I was like, it always sounds like glitter. His wind chimes, whenever I want him to put wind chimes in something, I say, can you add some glitter? And he just knows what I'm talking about. I don't know. Glitter trap. Fuck it. Good night. And then I, just, <laughs> I fell asleep and then the next day and I was just like, glitter trap. That's how she gets down. And I'm just like, y'all niggas really ran with that. Okay. <laughs> sure. By coining this term, SZA not only defined a new subgenre but set a new standard of creative innovation for upcoming artists. The Whisper Singing Girls absolutely come from SZA. Summer Walker comes up after her. Even Sabrina Claudio, even though she's, you know, real problematic and not black, but I would put her in that same category. Alina Berez, I put her in that same category, which is like SZA's softer side. Like, of course, SZA has multiple angles to her, but she does have like a whisper singing element to her music or a softer singing because before her, like the major R&B folks are belting powerful singers and that's not SZA. She created a whole lane for for women to come and not have like, you know, these crazy diaphragms and these crazy vocal ranges, which previously, like, you know, Beyonce sets, you know, is the whole marker of that era. Released April 10th, 2013, S showcased just how much SZA has grown as an artist in the last six months. Her vocals were more confident, the production was cleaner, and her writing noticeably improved as well with songs like Castles and Ice Moon providing a glimpse into the caliber of vulnerable songwriting SZA would eventually be known for. If you're not vulnerable, you run the risk of losing people. There's something to be said about talking about your darkness or your shadows or where you hide at because most people are hiding in the same place you're hiding. On top of that, SZA's unique Glitter Trap sound helped her stand out in the blog era where every aspiring artist was uploading to MySpace, SoundCloud, and Dat Piff to get traction. Simply put, people loved S and through S, people grew to love SZA. Hi, you guys. That's all you got for her? SZA That's was it. finally carving out a place for herself in the world through her music. Her authenticity and relatability not only endeared her to fans, but set her apart in the increasingly crowded landscape of the blog era. The talent was there, the personality was there, and the passion was there. It was clear SZA was primed to become a remarkable artist, and so the world began to watch. While SZA still had a lot of fears about being an artist, she trusted the process. And it didn't hurt that SZA was falling in love with music more and more 
more every day as something about it just kept drawing her in. I think being an artist requires a lot of like belief and investment in yourself in terms of energy investment, right. like your own thoughts. Yeah. And I didn't want to commit to that. And I was really just like, no, this is a life's work that I'm not signed up for. But it, I, I'm addicted to like creating things what and like absorbing that? information. It was around this time in 2013 that SZA moved from New Jersey to Los Angeles to further her career. As a fresh artist on the scene with some credibility and buzz in LA, SZA had a lot of options in terms of where she would take her music career. Initially, SZA wanted to join the ranks of Frank Ocean, Mac Miller, and most notably Odd Future, signing to Christian and Kelly Clancy's label Four Strikes. At the time, Odd Future dominated the music scene and were the poster children for counterculture during the blog era. I wanted to be like Odd Future. I felt like a Clancy girl. Odd Future, when they first started off, there wasn't like the seriousness about music because they were all so young and they were hungry for sure. They were hungry to get famous, but like production wise, like they were just kind of like experimenting young kids. I think she would be great as far as getting along with the Odd Future members, but I don't know if it would have propelled her career the way TDE did. She needed somebody like Punch to like, like really push her. I don't know if she would have exactly. got pushed as hard and like challenged as much if she was with Odd Future. Cause if you look at Odd Future, they have the heavy hitters and then everybody else is like- Just floating. Yeah. yeah. SZA resonated with Odd Future's energy and was attracted to their innovative approach to music. She was even releasing songs singing over Odd Future beats at the time. But ultimately, SZA found herself increasingly drawn to Top Dog Entertainment, not just because they recognized her talent, but because they treated her like family. It's a real family then environment. They're, they're big brothers. They're like the oldest souls in the business. They're so young and they just have granddaddy vibes, all of them. Granddaddy Kendrick and then Sam, <laughs> then J-Rock is so grown. Q, like he's groovy and he just be on his little leg <laughs> with his pop pop hat. Snappy beard. I know, yeah, you, know. <laughs> you know. TDE were like big brothers to SZA. They believed in her before she even dropped her first EP. They supported her as an artist throughout her journey so far and they helped her whenever they could, all without asking for anything in return. So the choice was clear. SZA would sign with Top Dog Entertainment along with fellow upcoming artist Isaiah Rashad, becoming the label's first female artist on July 14th, 2013. Me and SZA met probably, I think the week after I moved back out there. Where would he get up? Oh, to uh, the first couple of days. Why? Why not? She's a sweet girl. She's just like, who are you? And you guys are both and, new. I mean, we both it's new. Competition. We both, mm. we both thinking that we have a purpose. You know what I'm saying? Although there was tension between the two new signees, it was short lived after realizing the artistic chemistry they shared. Isaiah Rashad and SZA discovered they had complementary writing styles, taste in music, and even vocal textures. The two would quickly become frequent collaborators on each other's projects. Kendrick Lamar would also give SZA a hard time making fun of her name. They'd be like, Suzanne? Is it Suzanne? I'd be like, this is too much. I'd walk out crying. Kendrick was most likely playfully joking at SZA to show his acceptance and break her into the group, as TDE will often joke around and keep things light. Shit just over here training rock. How that shit going over there? He doing uh... a... <laughs> oh, shit. He, he doing all right. Got SZA out there working? Shit, I don't know where the hell SZA at. She all in the trees climbing shit. I don't know what the fuck she doing. I'm playing golf, man. I left her about three motherfucking hours ago. But SZA genuinely felt like she had something to prove. I don't want to just fit in. I want to kind of like add something to this table. I want to bring something to the table and I want to like really, really earn my key. That was like my only issue. The scramble to like prove to other people that you deserved to be here. Schoolboy Q took the approach of welcoming SZA into TDE in a more inviting way. He's so just like generally fun. Like it was the day I got signed and he was like, come on, we going, this is not. And we were just like mosh pitting in the middle of a 21 Savage, so like in the crowd, <laughs> on, the, on the lower, and no, we were just like shoving people. And Ab Soul and SZA quickly bonded over esoteric subjects and deep conversations. So you don't know like that the topic is switched. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> or what's whoa. going on? But right. It's just like you're in another thing, and you're like, okay, I'm with you. All right, yeah. We're moving okay. on. Right. Okay, so now we're talking about Mars. All right. <laughs> the approaches each artist had were unique to themselves, but TDE made it abundantly clear. SZA was family. They reassured her, they uplifted her, and led by example, showing SZA how to grow into a more confident and respectable artist. They rub off on me in ways that I'm sure they don't intend to. Mm. I'm just like paying attention. They're not trying to do anything. It's, it's very beautiful, like each of them separately to watch and like to witness. It's artful. And with the support of Top Dog behind her, it was time for SZA to get to work. 
I wanted to bring up a friend that I pretty much guilted into playing this song that he produced. This is Mac Miller. <laughs> Say something to the people. Hi. <laughs> In 2014, SZA got a taste of what it was like to be in the big leagues. During this time, SZA developed a relationship with artists and influential figures outside of TDE like Rick Rubin, Chance the Rapper, Thundercat, and Mac Miller, who would produce multiple songs on her upcoming EPZ. On April 8th, SZA released her EP's lead single, Babylon, with an accompanying video. As TDE slowly debuted her music to their fan base, SZA was becoming known as the First Lady of TDE. Even though real ones know the real First Lady of TDE was Aloy Jo, rest in peace. But that's for another video. With the pressure of TDE's passionate fan base, her already invested original fan base, and her family back home all waiting for the official debut, SZA was determined to drop something everyone would enjoy. It was the first time I worked, I was forced to work like over the course of a year on something. It's just the hardest thing I've ever done, and I really hope that people enjoy it. SZA's EPZ was released on April 8th, 2014. Debuting at number 39 on the US Billboard 200, it featured Chance the Rapper, Isaiah Rashad, and Kendrick Lamar. The marketing for both the EP and SZA herself was executed effectively, with many eagerly anticipating the debut of TDE's First Lady. And when it released, Z was good. But that's it. Z was just good. The lyricism is easily the highlight of the project with some really engaging stories and thought-provoking lyrics, but in my opinion, the overwhelmingly mellow atmosphere really drags the EP down. When I say overwhelmingly mellow, I mean despite choosing a neo-soul, hippie, chill wave sound that's on a softer side, Z still manages to drown itself out in ambient noises and chimes to the point where you can't even hear what SZA says at times because she's being overpowered. Don't get me wrong, most of the tracks on Z are good on their own. Personally, I think it's just a problem of lack of contrast. It's tough to truly appreciate the pretty chill wave and glimmery aesthetics if we don't get a chance to really miss them. If you listen to SZA's follow-up project compared to this one, I think we would all agree that the results are night and day. But that's just my personal opinion. Let me know what you think about Z in the comments below. Like, I do like the muddiness of Z. I like how it's not as crisp. You're just kind of seeing the earlier stages of an artist becoming an artist, right? And sometimes that's like the best thing ever is knowing that you saw them from the very beginning and you saw how it evolved but you also saw like the passion like how passionate she was about music even though it wasn't necessarily the best quality at the time. Z was met with a mixed reception from both fans and new listeners, giving her a reputation for being a whispering singer, but ultimately growing her fan base. Amidst the adoration from her growing fan base, SZA found herself deeply appreciating the love and support. However, it was the validation from her parents that meant the most to her. It was almost like seeing her for the first time. Because I had seen her and my, and my husband, we had seen her in a different light. And to see her be who she wanted to be was like, okay, I get it now. It was amazing. It was amazing. <laughs> I wasn't surprised. <laughs> I always Hi, knew, Dad. <laughs> I always knew she had it in her. Always did. She had it in her from day one. She always had talent. She always had class. She always had skills. She was always her own person, and I respected that. It seemed that SZA had finally gained the control over her life that a young Solana yearned for. 2014 was the biggest year of her career so far. She hit the ground running with Top Dog Entertainment, collaborated with other artists, released her debut project, and now SZA had been invited to end the year opening for Janae Aoko on her Enter the Void tour. Thank you. 
Yet, as she stood on the brink of this new opportunity, a deeper, more troubling chapter of her journey was beginning to unfold, revealing shadows of her mind that she had yet to confront. I was open enough for Janae to go. It was a whole different vibe. My anxiety was so crazy because I'm like, damn, I'm like 198 pounds, 200 pounds, dressing different, I'm saying different things. Janae is like tiny, beautiful goddess energy, and I'm like, don't nobody want to fucking see me. Despite her self-consciousness and anxiety about performing, something suddenly clicked in Scissor's mind. And anyone who saw her perform had the same opinion. And he fucking snapped. The place was going crazy. And on that tour, on the Janae tour, you became a performer. And that's that was the first time I ever even sang with a band. So like I never even heard my music that loud before. So I didn't know I had to sing over the music and like really project. And then I had this weird fear where I was like, I know niggas don't know me. I know they're probably like, I don't really care. So don't play yourself. Up to this point in SZA's career, she hid her voice behind reverb and effects. This was most evident on her ear. PZ. But on this tour, SZA was out of her element. She was singing with a live band with nowhere to hide and an impatient audience waiting for Janae Aoko. So she was forced to adapt. And the anxiety made me crack open a new part of myself that had nothing to do with what I look like, nothing to do with perception. It was just a, a different stage presence, like a different version of me. And I, I wasn't singing in falsetto. I wasn't hiding behind plugins and shit and reverb and like editing and shit. I was just sometimes just yelling, but I had to do that to find myself. But along with her improvement, stage presence and confidence as a performer, a second clip occurred in Sis's mind. Revealing a hidden internal struggle that she will be forced to confront. The person that I become when I'm on stage, when I'm not thinking, the anxiety is so much that I just like depart from myself. The first time that ever happened was at like Janae's tour and I'd never been on stage in front of that many people before. And I was like, these people don't know me. Like, this is crazy. They're gonna be like, who the fuck is this bitch? I don't wanna see anything. And I almost passed out. Like I was about to walk out. <laughs> My knees were shaking and Punch was like, are you? Are you okay? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm okay this time. And then I just went out there and just something happened. I just snapped. Like, I don't know. My brain just disconnected because it was so scary. I couldn't be in my own like mind and body anymore. Experiencing disassociation was a harsh wake up call. Just when SZA thought she was gaining control over her life, she literally lost control of her mind and body. This caused SZA to confront the darkest corners of her mind and reevaluate her journey in ways she never anticipated. And strangely enough, the pressure of niggas counting me out gave me the same pressure of like being on stage in front of thousands of people who didn't know me. Like when you had to open up for like one of the prettiest girls in the game. Like it was stressful. A young Solana was desperate for control and as SZA, she aggressively pursued it only to find herself failing to grasp it fully. This struggle led SZA to seek a deeper understanding of the nature of control. And whether she knew it or not, this quest for understanding would become the foundation of her critically acclaimed debut album. Three years after the release of Z, SZA released her debut studio album, Control, and it was an immediate critical success. On Control, SZA let her voice take center stage for once, and the pure confidence of her voice branded her as an artist who sings in cursive. Not only that, but the clarity in SZA's voice put a larger emphasis on her songwriting, connecting SZA to her fans on a deeper level. It featured Travis Scott, Kendrick Lamar, James Font Leroy, and Isaiah Rashad. Control debuted on the Billboard 200 at number three and was nominated for four Grammys, while SZA was nominated for Best New Artist. One thing about that girl, she's going to tell you how she feels and she's not going to hold no punches. Her her music is who she is. I feel like, you know, we know SZA because it's like SZA wanted a big butt. She got her big butt. But like, you know, she had been singing about that for years. Like all the things that she was ever insecure about, like, you know, we knew like what she was insecure about because she put it in all her music. It's very raw, very authentic. But how did SZA get here? What happened in the three year gap? between her EPZ and her debut album, Control.
it was a head fuck. It was just really yeah. hard. No one wanted to like ride with me or just like help me make shit. And yeah. I just had to, but I really went within and like learned a lot about myself. After the release of Z, the facade of SZA being a new poppin' artist in LA wore off. People heard her EP and they just weren't impressed. After Z, everyone was like, yeah, like she's on that whisper shit. Like yeah, it's yeah. just gonna be some real like boring shit or whatever the case yeah. may be. And I couldn't get no writers to sit down with me. But amidst all the doubt, Rihanna took a chance on a young SZA and asked her to write on her album Anti. I do advise you running, running on back when you're breaking it down for me, cause I can hear you too. I don't know, she just kind of like believed in me cause she called me a few times and it never really turned into anything. The first time she called me, I was just like, I have no idea what I'm doing here, I have no idea. I have nothing for her. Six months later, like she called me back again. I was in a different place and I still was like, I don't know why I'm here. I have nothing for you. Every time Rihanna reached out, SZA had no music to share until SZA took a trip to Michigan to reset and work on her debut album. I felt very relaxed when I came back. So I played Consideration being like, I don't have anything else to offer because again, I don't know why you called me, but, <laughs> but I have this. Right. I mean, <laughs> trip in Michigan, SZA recorded songs like Broken Clocks, Love Galore, 20-something, and Consideration with intentions of putting them all on her album. But with Consideration, she wanted Schoolboy Q to feature, and when he couldn't do it, SZA shared it with Rihanna. I asked Q to be on Consideration <laughs> before I gave it to Rihanna. I was like, because when I was going to be on my album, I was like, I need you to be on this song. He, just, he didn't have time at the time because he was like recording and doing a bunch of stuff, but thankfully he didn't because it ended up on Rihanna's yeah, album. Right. Q did you a favor. <laughs> consideration ended up being the first song on Rihanna's album Anti, which was a critical success and gave SZA the credibility she needed to showcase her amazing writing abilities. I'm always fascinated and a little jealous of people who can walk the line of writer and artist. It's different in rap. Normally when we write it, we want to perform it. And R&B is a little different. Your pen is amazing. Thank Your you. pen is amazing. Thank While working on the album, TDE guided SZA into writing all her songs herself, further sharpening her pen and confidence as an artist. I understand with SZA, you were responsible for forcing her to write all of the songs herself. She's a very, very complex artist, complex person. So she don't view herself all the time how the masses actually view her. Like she'll do something incredible, everybody will love it, and she'll feel like, eh, it's okay. Then it'll be, I hate it. So it's like trying to navigate through that. I don't want to kill her process at the same time. So it's like you, you threading the needle with it. Like you got to be very cautious and very delicate on, on how you approach that situation. After three years since her last project, SZA's album was slowly rolling out with tweets and social media posts to build anticipation. But all the anticipation would be accompanied by disappointment as the album would continually be delayed. We got to talk control. What is it? What's going on? Um, what you mean? <laughs> With the album, we're getting it. Yes. When? Oh, I can't say that. Come yeah. on, you're on the cruise show. Of course oh, you can. This album has been driving me crazy. It was supposed to drop February 3rd. Was then that was, <laughs> was that's, that's, well, what that's what I we heard. Yeah. That's what I well, heard. That's what she told us. <laughs> yeah. That, that's she what did. I had marked down in my calendar. Then it oh, didn't drop. No. And I just want to know Punch why. Punch told us. No, <laughs> yeah. And just when fans thought Control was around the corner, SZA tweets, I actually quit. What did I say about TDE? Like, I quit TDE. It was last year. I didn't say TDE. I said I quit. Music. Oh, okay. Yes. I'm, I'm like easily angered, and I was having just an exorbitantly bad day. Yeah. And like completely unconnected to music, just on some family shit. Like she was going through a lot, like personally, and we talking about the album, and she was talking about her sound and hit records. I'm like, yo, you don't have a sound yet. You don't have hit records yet. She got hot. She didn't like that. So like immediately after we hung up, that was the tweet that went out. I had just buried somebody like that day. This was like a very sudden, like young person. I was just in a bad mood and I was already arguing with Punch, asking him a bunch of questions and he was being very vague mm -hmm. and there's nothing that drives me more crazy than vague answers. So I was like, wow, bet. And yeah. that is wild out. Greatness takes time. A lot of times as the listener, we don't always realize like what's going on in the background. Sometimes it could be that they're having a little bit of a rut, like a creative rut. Either they don't know what to write about, they don't know how to put it in words, they don't know how to put it in the music. It's a lot of things going on. I don't feel like an artist like her should be pressured to push something out. Like I think she's really, really in tune with music. When she's ready, it's good. And rushing someone like that, to me, will just result in less than ideal music. So her taking her time, it was completely fine to me because I just knew it was gonna be a banger and it was.
Multiple delays and setbacks later, SZA finally releases her album Control, prompting many people to wonder why that name and not A. Why, <laughs> why did you decide to name it Control? I, I really thought you were going to name it And you're missing some of the letters in there, so it's obvious you did drop out of school, but go ahead. I know. I, well. I, thought, I really thought you were going to name this next album A. So, okay, short story. Reading about transcendence and about like how transcendence is actually a departure completely from a state that you, okay, you are don't. in. Yeah, I'm, and like, I'm, like, like, I'm following you. I'm following no, you. No, hold like, on. The fact that it's spelled like a computer key. So like you think of the analog process of the nostalgia of a PC, of dusty things. When those things were relevant, I was very young and mm-hmm. going through all, a lot of thoughts and growing. And I think control has always been something I've been struggling with. Like I played sports. I was a gymnast forever and I was a dancer and I would go to school and, and get fire grades on things that I was into. And then the things that I wasn't, it would just be like, I'm bored. I'm gonna, and I just wouldn't do anything, like literally. Like I grapple with control in all facets of my life for my entire life from right. weight, death, family, love, et cetera. Or just like experiencing control or having other people be in control of me or like I wanted to control the way people saw me, thought of me, controlling the pitfalls or the pain. Right. Like trying to control the pain and flux. Like how much can I take at one time? Like can I just like slow it down or like avoid this by yeah. not? To, it's just like it's not possible. It was just more so just that grapple. But people were trying to control me. They wanted more for me, and it comes from fear. Like my parents want. They're both from the south and they're black and they're older. And they don't come from anything. Like they just wanted me to be better. But some of that comes from like suffocating. Like you can suffocate your kids trying to control them. But then as a kid, you think you're pulling back and forth with control or like even as a grown ass person like I'm dealing with control every day who's in charge of me and who's theoretically in charge of me and I feel I'm in charge of me and the rest of the world is like who has influence over my thoughts and my life and my being that's other people how do I feel about that do I need autonomy like Mm -hmm. what is control it's 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 like the give and take the push and pull it's very elusive on top of that because it's just like I got it you think you got it every time or the second you may get it for like a full three days or like have a nice week run and then (laughs) And the way the world works, the way the universe works, it's just not not meant to exist. We probably just made the word because we needed it to exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Shit. Like, <laughs> what you been thinking about? Right, time to oh, roll up, sir. God, no wonder, no wonder you such a great writer. You really get very introspective. <laughs> Thank you. When Control released in the summer of 2017, SZA was completely unavoidable. I vividly remember walking around my university's campus freshman year and hearing the weekend play out of 75% of girls' dorm rooms. Do you remember, because I wrote about this in my essay, do you remember freshman year when every girl's dorm was playing a uh... weekend yes, yes. <laughs> okay okay this might be tmi but i had somebody tell me oh my god i'm the weekend okay like, i was like if you don't shut your ass up bro <laughs> <laughs> get out of my face SZA made a very raw and vulnerable album that spoke to not just women, but an entire generation of 20-somethings navigating young adulthood and growing up in a digital age. The energy when you start with rad. Supermodel. I was fucking your friends when you were in Vegas. It comes in so hard. That sounds so bad to say. I was fucking your friends. I was fucking your friends when you were in we're Vegas. starting the album. You should have been listening. What's up with the type of girl that you take a mama? The type of girl I know my daddy be proud of. SZA was the beginning of our generation having our big people. Everybody, like before, like they had their folks, but I didn't, growing up, feel like I had somebody who was speaking to how I was feeling, especially because she was so similar to our age that like we're hearing her grow up in her music and we're growing up with her. Just like the coming of ageness, like you think about 20 something and like how everybody in their mother like is like i feel that to my core like it's something that is universal like all the 20 somethings are like the 20 somethings you know she kind of just started looking 
different. And I guess that also impacted like her self-confidence at the time. Because when I first got into SZA, she had like the poofy, crazy red hair. She was a bit bigger, I guess. She had like the the fake freckles thing going on. And she, I guess she wasn't exactly society's idea of beauty. She wasn't the beauty standard at the time. And her music, I guess, reflected that a little more. Like she kind of had maybe some self-esteem issues that she was battling and like, you could really hear it in her music. And when it came to control, like I think this was the start of her getting more comfortable in herself and her appearance. Control pulled no punches. It was selfish, dirty, and honest. The album resonated with so many people because it was unapologetically real, capturing the messiness and beauty of growing up and finding oneself. If you want to see my full deep dive on Control, you can check it out early on Patreon. I'll also be uploading a director's cut of this video where I'll be going over my ideation, writing, and editing process. And as a thank you to my patrons, I'll be giving away two Control vinyl albums. Check the description of this video for more details on that. Hey, you're, you're the GOAT, the fans want to know when's the new album coming out? With the release of Control, SZA found herself thrust into the spotlight, dealing with intense pressures of fame and her own struggles with anxiety. How is all this fame, the lights and everything working for you? I'm having an anxiety attack per day. Really? <laughs> How are you? The sudden influx of attention was overwhelming, and SZA often spoke about how it affected her. Balancing her newfound fame with her personal well-being became a significant challenge. It's weird. It's like even the heels and like tighter clothes and other things, I'm still just me. So I have a lot of anxiety about the world and like my thoughts and what people think about my thoughts. But SZA was already on a direct flight to superstardom. While there were some benefits to her success, the negative consequences of fame slowly began to wear down on her. <laughs> Yeah, of course. I've never said no to a photo. Really? Mm -mm, never. I think the only time that really affects me is like if I'm sad. When my grandma was in the hospital in St. Louis and shit, right. and like people would walk up to me like at the gas station or like, and be like, oh, like what are you doing here? And I'm like, oh yeah, my grandma's like really sick. She's in the hospital. She on life support. Like, they'll be like, oh, like, can I get this picture though? Are you like, serious? Oh, mm -hmm. Yeah, on me. I literally just move on for whatever I just said. And I'm like, yeah, right. of course. Um, and then we get into the vibe, but it's it's like, cause I know you don't give a fuck. That's what I'm saying. Like, I mean, control, a classic by all standards. We can't wait to see what you got. I think you, you gotta drop all- While dealing with fame, SZA would have a great amount of empathy for her fan interactions and their experiences, even if it was a detriment to her own well-being. Or I remember like when I got to the Apple store mm -hmm. and my Nana, my other Nana who had passed away, I lost all the pictures of her on my phone. Oh my God. And my phone was on some bullshit I was like, please, like, whatever you can do to get this shit back. Yeah, and they, they were like, something. and they tried, and then, like, that shit was just gone. Like, it was just unretrievable. So I was just, like, crying in the Apple store. And I was oh like, wow. God. And then the staff just came up and was like, can we take pictures? And I'm just oh like, oh my fucking God. Yes, of course you can. No matter how much SZA openly spoke about her anxiety, her deeper, more vulnerable thoughts, and not wanting to be put in a box, her pleas were met on deaf ears. We're multifaceted, mm -hmm. period. Like, as a diaspora and then as a gender, it's kind of coming in and not being pigeonholed into one space like damn you walk in and you're amazonian and thick and yeah. you like to shake booty but you're also so much more than that like you're a student you're a boss you're a queen a leader you like you're a dancer like a barbie icon like giving me princess but also giving me like strength giving me like powerhouse giving me many facets of being so i feel like that first step when you walk in it's like people are trying to tell you like you black and you a girl, I already, I already know. Like, right. wait, let me let me tell you exactly <laughs> how we see you, right. and you can take it from there. Midi has always portrayed SZA as someone she wasn't, or at least didn't want to be perceived as. But she had a friend in the industry that was no stranger to navigating and fighting both the media and public perception. Yeah. <laughs> I 
I got a cheeseburger. Fucking vegans. Um, can I say the girl? Can I say big clip on TV? I think, I think you think just said. I don't hate vegans. I just don't give a fuck that you're vegan. Stop shoving it down my fucking throat. How many times do you think you've been canceled? Let's play higher or low. Starting from age six to age twenty-five, maybe three hundred and fifty times. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Cause... My mom cancels me. Right. <laughs> yeah, bitch. Doja is definitely known for not giving a fuck and doing what she wants. And while people have a lot of issues with it, it serves her really well. She's very, very successful and, in my opinion, extremely talented. While I don't know the background conversations between the two of them, I think them getting together, having that friendship, probably influences it for the better, you know? Like, she probably realized, okay, I'm, I'm at a level of stardom where I don't have to be society's way of perfect or a good artist because no matter what, someone's gonna have something to say. And people have always had things to say about Susan since the beginning of her career. It started off with their looks, than like her style of music. I definitely think Doja probably influenced her for the better. In 2021, SZA released Kiss Me More, a pop song with Doja Cat, deterring from her usual hip hop and R&B influenced singles she released previously. What was it like uh, teaming up with SZA and working on that record? Because you guys are so different, but you complement each other so well on Kiss Me More. I say this every time. She was in my heart when I wrote this and I, I needed her to be on the hook and I needed her to put a verse. She brings like a depth to everything that she does. I went in writing the song thinking it was just going to be about kissing and have silly, goofy metaphors for kissing and things like that. But she took it to a level of I need love, like I need to be loved better. I need more love um, than what you're giving to me. So that kind of vibe, I feel like it's important. Kiss Me More went to peak at number three on a Billboard 100 and won SZA her first Grammy for Best Pop Duo Performance. Bro, you went to the bathroom for five minutes. Are you serious? I have never taken such a fast piss in my whole life. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I really appreciate it. SZA, you are everything to me. You are incredible. You're the epitome of talent. Uh, you're a lyricist, you're everything. And I, I need you, I just need you to say something. Just something, just something. Please give them something. Thank you, Doja. Thank you to my mama. Thank you to God. And just thank all of y'all. I'm glad you made it back in time. With every song released, SZA gained more and more notoriety and fame as an artist. And the fame dug up old habits, forcing SZA to confront her past. Let's get into the lies the evidence. Honestly, she is a beautiful liar. There's a whole thread of her in interviews. And like, she's not like a liar liar, but she's like a liar. She's like a liar like I'm a liar. Like she be lying about dumb shit. She don't lie about important shit. For example, she's in some interview. She's like, you know, I've, I've never owned a TV before. I've never had a TV. So, and then like, they'll be like, it'll be the recording of her saying some lie. And then it'll sizzle like with a TV. Just bought my first TV or you know what? I've never had a cake for my birthday. And then it's like sizzle with a cake for her birthday. Sad, cause I want to go vegan but I'm allergic to most foods and vegetables. <laughs> I have a lot more freckles. I wasn't born with that. They developed. I think she was just someone who was just really used to telling white lies, either because she just wanted to create a person, a version of herself that she really wanted to be and just wasn't at the time. And that really could be the case. I really don't know. Like little stuff like lying about having freckles, I don't really get that. But at the time she probably had some self-esteem issues or she just wanted to be perceived a certain way. And the best way she could do that was kind of just create this person in her head and believe it and maybe not realize that eventually it would catch up and she'd become a bigger star and people would like put the pieces together. While in her newfound fame, the effects of anxiety and being perceived by the world were catching up to SZA. Her attempts to control the narrative through lies only backfired. Not wanting to be perceived, like that sucks. Perception is just weird and, and being perceived on a mass level, it's just like, it sounds insane and like it's very unnatural like no matter how big of a star you might be she still has insecurities and whatever and so some people might just be catching on lies they, I've, I've seen examples 
but I don't I don't think she's a pathological liar. Just like a young Solana, SZA was again out of control. But this time, SZA decided it was time to let go. Let go of control, let go of fear, and let go of perception. It was time for SZA to let go and abandon Chip. With every big project, whether it's Avatar 2 or this album that takes a few years, there's usually a low point where it's like, none of this is working. This is never coming out. What was, assuming there was, this sort of low point in this process for you and how did you get out of it? Every week where I'd be like, this fucking sucks. I don't want to put this out at all. Up until the last week, I text Melissa and was like, we don't have to put this out. Like, we can just pull out <laughs> and pull it to January and... That's it. We can just let this go. And she's like, you can't. You're left crowning. You can't. Everything is loaded <laughs> into the system. You can't push the baby back in. I was like, we can push the baby back in. Even when I was track listing, I was like, oh, this shit is so boring or it sucks or when I couldn't get some of those things I wanted for like the initial cover idea or things weren't working out. I'm like, let's just put out no cover and no album and just leave everything blank. This happened so many times. Like I can't even tell you how many times. It's been five long years since SZA released her previous album. In that time, she seemed to disappear from the public eye, retreating from the spotlight that once embraced her. The internet is such a nasty place and everyone loves to be mean and critique and like, it's fun to hate on shit. And it's very fun to hit on me. So I'm just like, I guess I'm just gonna get ready for that on a larger scale, in which case I will never be outside again. And so I just expected everything to go that way. The very platform that elevated SZA began to suffocate her, pushing her to step back. Now with her return, she's not only re-emerging as the artist we know, she's finding her way back to herself. Trying to regain and maintain control often is too taxing on us. Uh, on our mental states, um, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes you just have to let go. And once you let go, that's where your true power comes in. SOS released on December 9th, 2022, and was by far SZA's most successful album, but she couldn't help but anticipate some sort of backlash again. Didn't go that way. And it's also really scary that it didn't go that way because I'm like, now what do I do? And when do the tides turn? Like. When does everyone decide that like they hate me again or that this sucks or blah, 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 or I don't know. And I, that's unhealthy. That's something I need to like talk to my therapist about. But I definitely, I don't know what to expect or what any of it actually means ever. SZA was expecting backlash, but it never came, at least not in any meaningful way. I saw this one tweet that was saying, okay, years later she drops SOS and she's still talking about being like a side chick or she's still talking about being heartbroken. I'm like, girl, we've healed now. Like, come on, like, talk about something else. And to me, it's like, dude, like, it's not a race, you know? Healing, whatever that looks like for different people, whatever, it's not a race. At least she's being treated herself. SOS became her first project to reach number one on a Billboard Hot 100. And SOS didn't just reach number one on the charts. SOS dominated the charts. When she dropped that shit, bro, when she dropped that, I was like, she really outdid herself. And then the numbers didn't lie. Like she was breaking record after record every week. She's still breaking records. To this day. To this day. <laughs> SOS was the biggest streaming week for an R&B album by a woman and the first to stay at the charts for more than 10 weeks since Mariah Carey's self-titled album in 1991. After 18 weeks at number one, SOS became the longest running number one album by a woman since the chart launched in 1965, breaking the 50 held by Aretha Franklin. And on top of all of that, her single Kill Bill reached number one on the global charts, expanding SZA's influence worldwide. Well, I never did it for the bar, I did it for respect. Huh. So for me, that bar, like the accolades are cool, but um, I was really just doing it for, for respect, to show that, no, I'm smart. I, cause I, did, I didn't finish school, I didn't get to like prove that point, to have like, oh, I had like this crazy, all these crazy degrees, like, I'm smart. So I was like, no, 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 me writing is me letting you know I'm smart. But that's a personal goal, not like on some, oh, you're respected because you sold mad records. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. that's not real to me. And I feel like people knowing, like, nah, 
that bitch is cold because she write all her own shit. She pick all her own shit. She design the way her show goes. She That's why I'm cold. Not because Direct some videos, I went number Seattle, one. Yeah, yeah, that's because I have ideas. Mm. She also struggled with starting to shed who she pretended to be for many years. This album was partially inspired by Love Lost, but mostly inspired by my departure from my attempting to be a nice girl. Because I think I've, I've tried to be a nice girl for so long and it's just not who I am. I am inherently. And I think I've done nice things and I am a kind person, but I'm not a nice girl. And that's okay. And I mm. think coming to talk with that mm. and really expanding upon that and exploring that is like this new chapter in my life. The albums before were more so like, this is what's going on. This is how I feel. Now with SOS, I don't give a fuck. Right. And she has plenty of songs that like personify that. There's the song Far, and I believe it. I think it's the first few lines. Uh, it's an interview with her and uh, Sad Guru. Sad Guru is like this uh, guru, for lack of a better word. The dude that's always sitting down with the long. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, she's like, how do you deal with rejection? Uh, I'm dealing with a lot of rejection right now. It makes me feel very small. And then he responds, with, oh, that's great. If nobody wants you, you're free. She spent her time going to therapy, focusing on her spiritual health and becoming a better writer. SZA's focus on healing herself served her well because following the success of SOS, she almost immediately started the massive SOS tour with 63 dates spanning across North America, Europe, and Australia. It was yeah. so fast though. The album came out. It's number one. We all love it. We can now tell you how much we love it. So the information's right in front of you at all times, all days. That was amazing. And then it's like, go hit the road. And so I can imagine that that's probably the most intense short period of time you've had as a person, that moment then. From SZA's first time experiencing disassociation opening for Janae Aoko's tour in 2014 to headlining her own tour in 2023, she's constantly transparent about how she navigates her challenges. Like, no, genuinely, I've never played arenas before or any of that, and it was so impossible. Like, it felt impossible to, like... Until it happened. Yeah, no, it still felt impossible <laughs> while I was doing it. I was like, I wasn't in it. I was more so just being like, I have to do this thing that people are coming to watch me do. And it like has to not suck because <laughs> they're expecting me to not suck. But I wasn't actually fully in it. But with the SOS tour, the way she spoke about her experience with anxiety and being perceived shifted. Everything is not a fucking battle. It doesn't, I don't have to prove a point all the time. Sometimes you can just make things because you feel like it. And is that what's been happening with the deluxe, with the new songs? Has it felt more free? I'm just making shit because I feel like it or because it's what I want, like because it's healing or because it's beautiful. Or yeah, cause... yeah. Since this whole life, she's been trying to prove a point, either to her parents, to her fans, to the record labels, to herself or to the world. But now SZA reached a point in her life where she no longer feels like she has to prove a point to anyone anymore, resulting in a blissful sense of freedom. It's kind of in its like own league a little bit. Like I think that she's similar to Frank Ocean in how much she stands out in R&B because she's so vulnerable but then also she does a lot more genre switching like so she's incorporating like trap elements funk elements she, her music itself is also a reflection of her being a weird girl so I think that like I would probably put her in a league of her own as like a very much a standout R&B artist. After all the setbacks, the doubt, the anxiety attacks, the public perception, and the negative media attention, SZA still struts onto stage in front of her tens of thousands of fans, performing with unwavering confidence despite the negative influences, whether internal or external. With every step towards the center stage, the crowd erupts louder in anticipation before SZA performs her hit song, Kill Bill. The sea of adoring fans, undeniably lost in the present moment, recite every lyric of SZA's songs, unaware that the very artist that's so engulfed in in this moment has mentally drifted away to the furthest place from this moment. SZA may or may not have recognized it, but her entire life has been one of extreme courage and relentless perseverance. SZA continues to push through her fears and doubts, using them as fuel for her art and performances. Her ability to channel those feelings into her music and stage presence is a powerful reminder that Bravery involves not just confronting, but embracing our deepest fears. I 
Scissor's journey shows that courage is not the absence of fear, but in the determination to move forward despite of that fear, even if you take one step at a time. Sometimes when my anxiety is at peak peak, and I just sink into this weird other place. I've never said no to a photo. You'll tell me you're anxious before like a performer, and then I will see you destroy that performance in front of thousands and thousands of people. As a child, they called her Solana. As she grew up, she adopted the name SZA as a shield of strength and identity. But in the end, what she's been searching for wasn't in a persona she created, but the lessons she's learned along the way. And so when she titled her second album, SOS, it wasn't just a call for help, it was a return. Well, I guess like, of course, it's like save our souls and then like save our shit, but it's also in like Supreme Alphabet, the S is like self savior. And then people call me Sos. My friends call me Sos for short. It's like Solana, but just shorter and cuter, I guess. SOS was the name her friends called her as a child. Well, my friends call me Sos for short. Solana just cut to Sos. Now, Solana and Scissor are no longer at odds, but one finally at peace with herself in the world around her. Scissor's journey teaches us that growth isn't about becoming someone else. It's about evolving, learning from our struggles, and finding peace with the path we're on. Whether it's through fame, challenges, or personal battles, we all face moments where the pressure feels unbearable. But like Scissor, we can find a way to rise above, embrace the lessons life gives us, and move forward with strength and clarity. In the end, it's not about being perfect or meeting every expectation, but finding peace within ourselves and our journey. Do you have like any SZA hot takes? SZA is a phenomenal songwriter. She's a phenomenal recording artist. She can't sing live. I have not seen her perform live. All right, all right, all right. Okay. There's too many videos. I'm like, bro, how many times are they saying that your mic is, oh, her mic was off? How many times is your mic going to be off so that you couldn't hear the words right or that you couldn't be on pitch? Maybe she has some off. Uh, all right. <laughs> they not going to, they. They're not going to like that. <laughs>